And so this contemplative approach was really how do I help kids pay attention to the present moment, pay attention to the God that they already know in some ways, and how do I help them notice that, name that, and begin to nurture that uh, relationship. And I used to really uh, uh, like to come up with creative ideas and new ways to teach truths to kids. And I realized, the, I think some of the youth said it last night, the best way we can teach them that they're beloved is just by loving them. And so uh, you can't really put a lesson together uh, to teach them that. You just do it. Dinner takes as long as it takes now, and, and instead of being anxious about what's going on, um, dinner becomes a very important listening time for me. You know, I'm, I'm listening to the conversation kids are having. I'm watching to see who's agitated and who's not getting along, and understanding that that's going to impact the evening, and knowing that um, that maybe we might have to shift gears, or you know, if something's happened at one of the school schools, or um, you know, kids wherever the kids are, we can tweak the evening so that it meets them in their needs and so we can find a way so that God can be present in the midst of whatever it is they bring with them to the evening. Usually in youth ministry what happens is we start with fear. What's going on in our culture? How should we respond? Our kids aren't coming to church. We better do something. And so we create ministries out of those things. I think I'm less afraid of failing. I mean, if I, if I mess up and it doesn't go right, I'm more confident that that I did what I was, what I thought to do, and I did the best I could do, and there's not much I can do about it from here. And, and the fruit is God, it's, you know. So if I mess up or something doesn't go just as I planned. It's almost a sense of relief when um, it's hard to let go of wanting to impart your wisdom on the kids. Um, but then it, it's a great uh, relief to, to, for instance, when we're doing a prayer exercise, to, to watch kids in silence and pray over them going, they're having their own encounter with God and, and God is doing God's work in them and I'm not having to do it. In contrast to other models of youth ministry, this youth ministry model doesn't begin with youth, it begins with the adults. Develop these spiritual uh, communities who began to listen to the presence of God and then create ministries out of that listening. And any youth minister knows that, that your best tool are adults who are alive, alive in faith. My, my uh, focus has shifted from what I plan to do to uh, what just unfolds in front of us as we go. That the ministry is, is much more, uh, is much less about what we're planning. In fact, that's generally uh, secondary. And it's almost an excuse to just gather. And, and then once everyone's there, what really starts to happen is the ministry. What it looks like in a church is, is you'll see communities of adults and youth, but you'll see some intentional, what we call an intentional spiritual community. It's a gathering of people that represent the whole congregation. This means retired people, single moms, young people, who are getting together every week and they're sharing their lives together. And, and being able to, to move from the anxiety of, you know, what are they learning, what are they learning to, you know what, they're here and, and God's doing the work. And um, I can create a space. Uh, it doesn't take much to create an atmosphere for, to allow kids to be attentive to God's presence. And the, the invitation of, of what we've learned is that youth will see right through anything they tell, anything we tell them if we're not modeling what we're telling. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that the more I'm attending uh, to myself, I don't know where I heard this, but uh, well, I hear it on the picture when you're on the plane, this is what I was talking about. Uh, you know, when the light, um, this dots the oxygen mask come down, I always say, please secure your own first before helping somebody with theirs. And 
there's been a real sense of that. I can't, if I'm not breathing good air, how do I help other people breathe good air? Their eyes are open enough to see what's happening there, to know that there's life there, and are now starting to say, maybe this is a model for the rest of the church. They're praying together, they're talking about their lives, they're noticing how God is present in their own lives. And out of that conversation, they're asking themselves, what are we called to do for young people? How is God working among us and how are we called to respond? The central thing that you would notice in them that might be different from another youth ministry is that they're listening. And you have to have a youth minister that's willing to give up control. It's willing to say, this ministry belongs to a lot of people in this church. How do I bring these people in and be a facilitator of ministry rather than the center of it? To, to rethink how I was going to manage my own time. And then when we began doing discernment with our, our kids our, around the youth ministry and what was going on in the ministry, and we first we started having check-ins for our youth group. When we had, when our youth group was large and we had 20 kids showing up and every kid takes a minute and a half to get check-in, we have 90 minutes, um, ergo... For me, it's just been the invitation to slow down. You know, Sherry, you're not supposed to do youth ministry as a lone ranger. You can keep having that conversation until you're blue in the face, but the reality is that's just not the way we're supposed to live as Christians. We're supposed to be doing this all the time in, in community with people uh, you like and you don't like. The, the, there's a danger that um, I resonate with a comment. I, you know, I'm, I'm already thinking of things I can do, things I can do, things I can do. And um, the discernment process is a process. Um, it takes time, and things need to kind of uh, incubate and, and, and I, I think the danger could be that you could take this as a magic formula and try and make what's on the paper fit church and what you really need to do is take the reality of your ministry setting and figure out how you can use these gifts that you've been given um, and, and I'm not sure that can happen uh, right away, you need to go home and say, you know, who, who, who are the people that I might need to be talking about for these covenant communities? Um, who, who are my kids? Who, um, who's the head of staff? Um, you know, how's my rapport with them, and, and how do they feel about spiritual disciplines and contemplative ministry? And um, who might this threaten? Um, you start asking some of those questions first. Um, and that, that actually is then the beginning of a discernment process. Puts it, puts it slowly. So look and notice and listen and uh, for yourself to see what is God already doing in this community. Uh, what are our what are our young people crying for here? And, uh, and don't and it'll start to bubble up. I think from there. Transformation is so rare sometimes, especially in the church.